Blog Talk Radio. Hey everybody, this is Beat Street Sports Talk Radio. I'm your host, Lee, a.k.a. The Hoop Guru. And it is Wednesday, May the 21st. As always, I got my partner in crime, Mr. MKA. What's going on with your brother? Yeah. I'm good, bro. What's the deal with you? I'm good. I'm good, man. You know, just you know, getting ready for this Final Four in the NBA. Getting um, the NBA draft lottery was last night. Uh, we're going to talk about that and, and anything you want to throw out as far as football or any other sports, man, feel free to bring it on. And any everybody out there in the listening world, if you'd like to add on to the band, say, give us a call at 347-945-6921. Yeah, hey, the Cleveland Cavaliers won this draft lottery again. They struck light in the bottle. They won the number one pick up all three of the last four years. Why don't they have a lot to show for it? Well, one... Uh, they go ahead and they have terrible management from Mr. Gilbert, who, you know, swerving down, you know, that Cleveland's going to be still a winning team, was going to be winning the championship before LeBron and all of the nonsense that uh, that he went ahead and spewed out. So no team is, is uh, ever been good when top of uh, the jokers upstairs in the suits uh, are not competent. Cleveland has shown not to be competent and not to be, you know, ran well. So it's really no surprise that, you know, you go ahead and you give Mike Brown a five-year deal and then you fire them after one year, and then the other people who they fired, you know, they just don't have a good track record, anybody in the whole front office. So, and then the whole thing that makes me sick with them getting a first round pick the last three years is that the South and Kyrie Irving, you know, they, they went ahead and they picked the other bum from last year who, you know, you tried to say it wasn't that bad, but he was, it was like the worst first round pick in recent memory. And I just feel as if that even now, they, whoever they draft coming up, is they're going to go ahead and waste their time in their career. And more than likely, they're going to go ahead and make the, the wrong choice with that, even though people believe there's no such thing as a wrong choice. Man, well, I don't, I, I still think, you know, it's only been one year. Um, so Benny did have a terrible rookie year, but it was a terrible rookie class. So he still has time to redeem himself uh, as far as that concerned. He's shown a little, I'm not going to say practice or brilliance, but he's shown some improvement at the latter part of the season. Let's see how dedicated he is with the summer under his belt, see if he gets himself on the way. See, you know, he was injured at the beginning of last year. So let's see what he does, over, what dedication he shows as far as professionalism is concerned. Now, with Cleveland with this first pick, to me, they didn't even make a splash because this draft and picks hasn't gotten them over the hump. I mean, because they, yeah, they have three of the last four, number one. But, two, they've been top ten, I think, since LeBron has left. I mean, remember, they got waiters. Tristan Thompson in the draft as well. So just where they've been hasn't worked. To me, they need to make a splash. And, you know, like I put on Facebook yesterday, and I like to, you know, see how crazy you think I am with this. But I'm thinking personally, trade Kyrie Irving. Trade him possibly to somebody like the Lakers who have the number six pick, or even someone like Orlando who has the number four pick. Trade uh, and then also trade the number one pick overall to Philly and try to get their number three and number ten pick. So in that regard, you can wind up having the third, fourth, and tenth pick in this lottery. And with those picks, I would translate it into Jabari Parker, Dante Goon, and someone like the the the, the high scoring shooting uh, small forward out of Creighton, uh, out of Creighton. Excuse me. Um, dang, what's Doug McDermott? or, you know, however they may follow. But to me, they can make a dynamic splash like that in the lottery as opposed to, you know, the guy that was on the top of their draft board, Joel, Joel Envy, who for some reason everybody thinks he's the next, uh, what's your boy down there? Um, oh, no, 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 no. I was going to say Anthony yeah. Davis. That's blasphemy. No, no, they, they, they said they said Akeem Olajuwon. Dude, Kim Olajuwon was a beast in college. He didn't he was like know, but, he was potential. I know, but here's the thing. I don't understand why this, guy, this, this guy just started playing basketball. They're saying his upside is Kim Olajuwon. I'm just, I'm just telling you what the so-called experts say. That's all I'm doing. What do you say? I say he's a bum and he's going to be like a mecha over for That's what I say. Man, why is this Ogilford, man? Why is this Ogilford? Listen, cause listen I, li- I liked Ogilford, but he, but his doggone years and productivity in the NBA was taken away because of the back injury. 
this kid has the similar back issues that Okafor had when he was in college. And everybody dug on look past, including myself at the time, and there was a debate on whether you took Omeka Okafor or you took Dwight Howard um, number one overall. And fortunately enough for Orlando, they made the right decision and went with the high school kid. But Omeka Okafor right. was actually rated at the, high, the highest center of the time. And with the back ends he had and with the time that he had him going to the tournament, he didn't play the last six games. And he's and like they said, yeah, it's true, he's only been playing basketball for four years, but he only playing four years, and it's obvious that he has a severe back issues. I'm not taking a young man that has back issues because that's something that's not ever going to get better. So to me, it's a waste to pick to go ahead and take him number one. Yeah, I just to me, I, I honestly, I've seen too much from Randall Parker and Wiggins to take him number one anyway. To tell the truth, um. I'm, uh, at this day and age, I don't, uh, you know, teams have been doing the potential draft pick and picking over the last 10 years, and they haven't gotten them anywhere. So, to me, take the talent that you – and they definitely need a small forward. Luau Dang's not going to resign there. You know, they had who uh, – what's that kid's name? Alonzo G, you know, starting at the small forward. They need a small forward. Wiggins and Parker can fit that bill. And to me, to me, they can be your long-term answer. You know, unless they think they're going to get their old small forward that left for Miami, they need to go and draft one of those dudes, I think. And also, they're loaded at forward and center anyway. You know, even though I heard Tristan Thompson's on his way out the door, to me, that's a little bit redundant. But uh, so, what do you think? You think they, who who should they draft? Should they trade the pick? What scenario would you do as GM? Well, apparently. Uh, the GM put out there that he actually has been receiving um, offers for the number one pick. So if he can go ahead and if he can trade that pick, still go down not too far away, he can still get um, another player that they target that they like, and, or maybe even like trade the pick and get like um, you know a player, and then also get a, a pick within a range that you know with someone on their board. Then I don't see no problem with it because of the fact that. You know, for the most part, they may need to go ahead and, um, you know, they may need to go ahead and get themselves uh, a future superstar or something of that nature because of the the fact that, you know, Kyrie, for all intents and purposes, is more than likely not going to stay there. So, they, you know, places like Cleveland and Milwaukee, they need to draft people and get, like, try to hit on Kevin Durant dudes, on dudes who love not being in line like in big city. And, and, you know, try to get due to that nature. Because most brothers and young players are not trying to stay in, in those type of areas because they can't, they can't get their freak on and party and all that stuff in boring areas like Milwaukee and Cleveland. So. See, and that, that's why, to me, I think they should get rid of him. Go ahead and get rid of Kyrie right now while, you know, his stock is high. And from what I'm hearing, the, the, that six foot six point guard out of Australia exudes the truth. So why not, you know, get yourself a – a tall point guard, you know, and just, you know, and still make a splash in his draft with um, and try to get as many picks as possible and load up a young talent and get rid of some of those veterans that are producing and kind of have a balanced attack that way. And you still have, and also, you know, you, you, you lower the risk of having to give Kyrie a max contract. You'll have four more years of a, of a point guard under a rookie contract and you can go after some high quality free agents. To me, that's the play. But, you know, I'm not the GM. You know, they're talking about Joel and me signing the draft board. So, hey, it is what it is, Cleveland. Well, you, they, you've had well, a better opportunity than most teams. Well, all those things sound good, but, you know, you have to get someone else that's going to be willing to go ahead and trade with you to make those deals happen. So, I mean, the other teams, yeah. those those ideas you came up with clearly only benefit um, – Cleveland, for the most part, the other teams really don't benefit from the stuff you want them to do. I, I don't say that because think about it. If you're like in Philadelphia situation, right, and you're the third pick, I, if I'm really, really high on Wiggins and I really want him, I'm willing to trade my 10 and 3 for number one. I, if I think this kid's the next LeBron or the next superstar, I'm willing to do that. Or a team like the Lakers. Only thing with the Lakers, they don't have a lot of assets to to trade up to number one, but Kyrie Irving exactly. would be enticed into them. So there's teams out there who definitely want to jump up, 
or they know, uh, let's say they know there's a team that may be interested in the player that they want, so they may be willing to deal so that they can grab the player that they want. Because um, I know uh, Orlando's high on this Exum kid at number four, so there may be teams that want to jump ahead of Orlando to get uh, get a, um, get the point guard. So when you have the number one pick, especially in this draft, I think you have a lot of cachet, man. It just depends on how you play it. Um, but let's talk about some other teams. The Lakers at six, I guess they're a little disappointed in Boston at seven. Uh, but Mark is smart. He will be available at six. Do you think that would be a big, a good pickup for the Lakers, or they should look elsewhere? Well, I've already spoken with uh, one Laker fan uh, in uh, Virginia. We spoke over today. He said that he wouldn't want Marcus Smart at number seven. He said he would rather take uh, Gordon out at the University of Arizona. I see, I didn't watch and, all, and, uh, and, and I also talked to uh, another uh, Laker fan on the um, – the sports site, and uh, somebody uh, put out there getting the uh, the 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 Joker from um, Syracuse, Ennis, and one of the Lakers fans also shot that down and said, yeah, he may be considered to be a true point guard, but um, that's not the type of player the Lakers are looking for now because, of course, they're looking to win now. So he also said, you know, Gordon or some other player over uh, Ennis. Yeah, I mean, you know, Ennis hasn't impressed me from what I saw him, especially, in the, you know, in the tournament. So I'm not, you know, he's not high on my list as some of the uh, point guards I've seen. I mean, shoot, the, to me, the, the point guard of Wichita State is going to be a steal this year from what he's shown me in the tournament as opposed to these little flashes of, br- of brilliance that some of these guys have shown. And I also see Clee Anthony early is really rising up the charts. He was a – before the tournament, he was considered, what, a, a high second-round pick. Man, this dude might make the tail end of the lottery now. And um, he's the next oh, yeah, well, he was really, he was really, he really impressive for. against Kentucky. Very. And, and that's what I'm saying. It's like if you, could, if you could parlay the number one pick into Philly's two picks and you could walk away with, like, um, a Randall and Clee Anthony or Jabari Parker – or, and Clean Anthony Davis or something like that, or that kid out of um, – I don't know how low he's going to go, the kid out of Indiana, the center, Noah. But um, uh, Well, the, the latest projection I've seen, because I, I, mean, I was discussing to people where Randall could go, um, the latest projection that I've seen on television was the Indiana kid going to Orlando just because of the fact that they said that he, he, could, be, he could play the stretch four position and that it wouldn't be as big of a stretch as something he had to work on as uh, Randall would have to at this time, plus he's taller. Man, from what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm hearing it very highly, or Randall's going to go after Dante Exum, the point guard, because they're not going to resign Jameer Nelson, and they want that big point guard to go alongside of Oladipo, trying to you okay. know, have that young backcourt. So, now, I heard that before, I, too, but here's the thing. Exum is bigger than Oladipo, so that means you're no you're normally going to go ahead and have Exum go ahead and be the point guard and run with a, a small shooting guard? Yeah, I mean, why not? You'll have 6'6 six, six and what, 6'4 okay. or 6'5? It's still a big backcourt. He's he definitely, he, he definitely not 6'5, so you, you can stop that. He definitely not that. Okay, but anyway, if your point guard is six, 6'6, six, you can always switch on defense, you know, so you're still okay. covered that way. So it, 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 right, it, it, it still works. Now here's the thing. You know, I know you're gonna, I know you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna piss on us a little bit, but I, I believe, because I know me, you had this, um, this discussion when they decided to do the All Star um, selections. Um, Black Boy Fly, aka Aaron Aflalo, he was having a good year for Orlando uh, at the shooting guard spot. So I mean, if Exum comes in, that means Oladipo would have to go on the bench, and Exum or Exum would have to go on the bench because. Aaron Aflalo was uh, very productive for them, and he was like their main scorer on the perimeter. Why you can't put him at the three and make Tobias see, Harris not, come off the bench? Let's see, I, let's see I, I heard that before too, but, you know, I, I know somebody else was saying, yeah, you can put him at the three. And I'm like, okay, well, do you put him at the three and you put Exum and then you put uh, Oladipo, then you know what? That could quite possibly work because I know me personally, I'm not really sold on Orlando's, um, you know, front court. But I know Wojcik, he, I guess I want, to me, he had a down year. And then I know that the guy who shouldn't be wearing um, 
D12's number. Uh, they like him a lot. So that lineup, if you go with uh, Aaron Oflalo as a three, Exum and uh, Oladipo, I think that's a better lineup than starting five they have now. But you know, I'm I'm still not still don't know what to think of Jack Vaughn and his coaching style and decisions and things. I mean, he's still young, so I don't know if that's something that they would do or not. Yeah, well, I know I, did, I didn't I didn't like their power forward situation. Um, they had the kid out of Norfolk State, I can't and Max Hill, I think I can't remember. Mm-hmm. I cannot, you know. But anyway, there there weren't names enough where they should still be starting on the NBA roster. So the kid uh, Noah out of Indiana, I can see how he can be enticing for them as well. But I just don't want. I wouldn't have my future going still going along with. Uh, you know, getting a second-rate point guard or doing the Victor Oladipo experiment at the one if you let Jameer Nelson go. Um, you know what? Well, that might not we're, be a bad start for the Lakers either, Jameer Nelson. But go ahead. Well, here's the thing. We're, we're, we're going to see how they feel about their roster based on who they pick because, like you said, they can go to Indiana K, they can go Randall, they can go Exum. So whoever they pick is going to let us know how they feel about their team because I personally think that they think that, that they're fine in the backcourt. Now, we both saying they're not, but they may think that they are. I want to see where this kid Doug McDermott goes, man. I really do. You know, uh, he was the, oh, the, 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 the next, uh, the next mainstream, the next mainstream hope. You know, hey, are you? Is where is he gonna go though? Is he, is he gonna wind up being um, a, a high a, a quality scorer? Or is he gonna be Adam Morrison? Well, everybody has been basically comparing him to those guys, but they've been saying basically that unlike Morrison, that he proves he can create his own shot, he's a bigger player, and the fact that he can do more than Morrison. So they're they're not saying he's going to be a superstar, but they're definitely saying that he's not going to be a bust like um, Morrison. To me, if, if, if you can hit on him, I'm thinking, and I don't know if this is bad or not to say for his ceiling, but if you can hit on him, I would think his ceiling would be, key, would be a healthy Keith Van Horn. So it all depends on how you thought about Keith Van Horn's game. Hey, uh, in the NBA, it wasn't bad. It wasn't stellar, but it, it definitely wasn't bad. Um, mm-hmm. But here's the thing, though, if you're taking somebody to the lottery, this, this person is supposed to be like a foundation building. Like, it, he may not even be like a superstar. He may be like a Kevin Love type dude where he's not a superstar but a star or like a, a very solid, um, you know, foundation building by police piece, but, I mean, that's the whole thing. The, the question is, do you feel that he can do that? I think, to me, to me though, he, he's not projected as lottery. I think he's projected somewhere between, like, uh, what, 14 and 17, somewhere in that area. Mm-hmm. But to me, I think with a white, with the right point guard in a system like, like Washington, he would be excellent in Washington. matter of fact, if Washington was able, was in the draft this really? year, Really? Yeah, I think he could actually replace Trevor, not defensively, but offensively, he could replace Trevor Ariza with the open looks he you was know, getting. You, you yeah, you know, right be able, I'm serious. Because if, or Chicago, because you, he's the type of player in the half court, he's going to be able to get you a quality shot. Defensively, he may need some help, but he's, I just think the nature of getting buckets with, with his kids not going to change. So if it wants well, the opportunities there, I still think he'll perform. Well, they're saying that the combine, that the NBA combine, that doesn't get the hype and that they don't go ahead and they don't market correctly. But from what I've seen and looked at it, they said that he um, tested out as a better athlete than what teams or, or you know people had thought. So they're saying that he's not going to be as big of a liability as like a you know like a traditional guy, though, like the Dunleavies and, and the Kyle Culvers. They're saying that athletically, that he's athletic enough where he shouldn't be a, uh, a liability on the NBA level. Well, I think he he might be a steal of the draft if he winds up going where he's he's projected. Because to me, he should be tail in lottery. Um, you know, from what I've seen in college so far, and if he's tested out that mm-hmm. way, because I, I you know I, I I just think he's going to be able to score buckets if he's given the right opportunity. And there's a lot of teams that need guys to be able to score, especially in the half court, man. You know, like Washington against the Pacers, when they cut when they slowed it down, a reason you know, once they slowed it down, a reason couldn't get nothing off. You know, once they decided mm-hmm. to uh you know, kinda of play him up close, he couldn't beat anybody off the dribble. So 
you know, he went from, what, like 20, 25 games to, like, six and eight. So, but, you know, I think McDermott on the right team, he can give you a constant 10 to 12. And that, that's a big drop so, off for him for the, for the minutes. So you're saying in the lottery, so that means you feel if he go to a team like Phoenix, that's a, that'd be a good spot for him. No, because they just they got too many weapons on him. Like when, he wouldn't play. <laughs> you know no, he would saying? play. Like, he would play. I'm gonna tell you who play. wouldn't be playing. Ooh. One of them doggone twins wouldn't be playing, and I know exactly which one would not be playing. Well, wow, there's <laughs> which one? There's one <laughs> that shoots threes, and there's one the one that shoots threes or the one that goes to the basket. The one that go to the basket would not be on the floor. <laughs> They're not switching them. They're not getting rid of the twins, man. No, They're no, no. no. I'm not talking about get. I'm not, no. I'm not talking about dog. Get rid of them. I'm just talking about hey, dog. You know, you you might be sitting next to Horny a little bit more. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Uh, they're just you know yeah. I guess they can get rid of PJ Tucker. Um, who, who's gosh? Well, I can't remember the name. What's the name of the guy? Uh, yeah, Channing Fry. I guess he's he's staying. But honestly. They're in a good. They're in a good situation, except for they're probably going to lose Eric Bledsoe, so he's a free agent. He, he, hold on, I thought he when he left. Um, so hold on, so when he when he um went from the Clippers to Phoenix, that was via trade. That wasn't through free agency. Yeah, that yeah, that was a trade. Okay, so, well, no, I think what it it will behoove him, as they say, for him to go and stay in Phoenix because um that's a good spot for him. And, you know, if he was to go and stay healthy, because he was healthy, he would have had a, a much better season. But, yeah, especially if he was to bounce, oh, that definitely will, will open up dogs on doors for McDermott if they were able to get him at the 14th pick. Yeah, so I'm gonna, it's going to be interesting to see where he goes. We're going to be also seeing him uh, when my boy James Young goes from Kentucky. I think he has the opportunity to be a stud as well. Um, yeah, I'm really surprised that they have him rated as going as high as they're trying to say he can go. I'm kind of surprised by that. I mean, when they have him going where, like seventeen, eighteen, that that. No. That's it. No, they have him going lottery because oh. of his shooting, what, and I'm what, thinking to myself, what what shooting are they talking about? I mean, it's crazy though, because I mean, like you see some of these draft boards, and I see Julius Randle going as low as eight, and to me, that's crazy. Like, no, but here's the thing like, though, what? and that, I was I was just talking about today. They were saying that Randle may get may go lower than what he should because of the other team's needs. Because I agree with you. I, I know I was talking to a Laker fan today, and he was saying that, you know what, they could quite possibly, that Randall more than likely is going to end up, I believe, at the pick before the Lakers at six to Boston. I was like, okay, well, I can see it too, based on, you know, the conversation we've already had just now about the, the top six picks. But he's, he's not the sixth best player. He's higher than that. But because the team needs or because of what teams already have on their roster, he could possibly drop to six, seven, or eight. Yeah, I mean that, and that would be a great pickup for a team, a team like the Lakers. It's, you know, just a, a solid double double guy. Especially if they, I don't know what they're going to do with Paul Gasol and everything, but I oh, think he's he gone. Show, he's definitely gone. They're not going to resign him. No, nah, because I think no, nah, because uh, Gasol is going to want uh, X amount of dollars. The Lakers going to be telling him he's tripping off of. Now, I don't know where he thinks he's going to get that, but, I mean, apparently he thinks he's going to – I mean, the thing is, remember, there's interest for uh, Powell going to Phoenix. I don't see how that's going to work, but, I mean, I know that's the, he's, that's the player that uh, that they wanted. That doesn't even fit their style of play. I know, so, but cause he, you know, my thing is he's not that type of dude no more where you can go ahead and expect to get 60-plus games from him and let him produce on a high level because he had plenty of opportunity to take shots this year, and he wasn't taking them. Man, you know what? This might, but I, we've seen a lot of players have checkout years in the NBA. You know, where it's like, listen, man, I'm just, I'm just trying to finish this season, and you know, I'm not trying to mess up my statistical numbers and move on. I, I have a feeling that might be a kind of season that Gasol has. I think you'll see a resurgence from him next year in the new environment. You know, mm-hmm. especially if he comes, to, especially if he comes to Washington. You know, right. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, throw, throw, play, come on and play with um, the name, man. That would be a beautiful thing. Um, now, do you want to continue to talk about the draft, or do you want to, um, uh, for the last few minutes, talk about the NBA games that were uh, played over the last night? Yeah, last we can talk about the NBA games. 
Well, let's go. The uh, Miami Heat pulled it out last night, and if you're an Indiana Pacers fan, you got to be upset because, honestly, the game went your way probably for 44 minutes. It was your type of game. And for Miami to go ahead and do their classic, you know, we'll, we'll keep the score tied and go on one run and just blow you out the frame and take the game, you know, now now you got to feel kind of some kind of way um, going down to Miami with the score tied. But I think my, Indiana should have a little bit of confidence because they they've been the dominant team in the, in, the, in these two games, even though the record doesn't show. Um, what do you feel? How you know how should teams be feeling right now that the series is tied one one? Pretty much what you said. They they should have felt as if they should be up two zero, and uh, but you know now they know that they got to go ahead and go down to Miami and get a split, and you know. Of course, like I told you and anybody else, you know, they're going to piss a lot of people off because the effort that people felt that they should have been exhibiting the uh, previous rounds, you're going to see that every night from them against the Heat just because of the fact of who they're playing. So, you know, at first I thought the series should have gone five games, but because of the fact that they um, are going to be motivated against Miami, it's going to go it's going to go six or seven. You know, it's going to go six or seven. But... Yeah, any I mean, they know they're still in. They just got to, like you said, they just got to go and get the home field back. And Miami knows that as well. So, they, you know, that game three, you know, all the even numbers are all big. You know, game one, three, five are all big games. So this first game in Miami, we're going to see how it goes down. But the interesting thing is that Miami was, you could say they were hot that game. So I don't even know if Indiana's going to change their game plan much. I think they're going to give them the same shots because, LeBron James didn't score a high volume of points, but he had like 23 or 25. And mm. um, he, I believe he only went to the free throw line once. He may have gotten some garbage free throws at the end of the game once it was once they had a, like the built up like a seven point lead. But for the most part, right. you could say LeBron was contained. Um, I just think you know Indiana's going to try to feature David uh, a little bit more aggressive with David West, um, because. You know, it's funny, LeBron James, you know, after that first game, he's like, hey, I prefer to play defense on the perimeter. You know, he don't like really defending dudes down on the block. And I don't even know why you would vocalize that. And he's saying David West is – between David West, Shaq, and Hercules, those are like the three strongest dudes he knows, I guess, playing ball. So David West must be a lot stronger than um, I thought he was. Um, but it seems like LeBron don't want no part to him now on that block. So to me – Indiana should pay attention to that and really try to get them in pickable situations where, where LeBron's defending them in. Maybe it's wearing them down, you know? Well, here's the thing. I know someone said that on the uh, on the sports page, and they were saying, well, I don't know why Indiana is using um, Hibbert in pick and roll. That should be Doug West. And I said, okay, that's real simple. If they use West in pick and roll and then they go ahead and they decide to double or converge to the post, that means you're going to be leaving Hibbert outside open for jump shots. Indiana don't want that because they know they're playing themselves. They do that. So they're forced to use Hibbert the majority of the time in pick and roll situation because at least if you double off of West, he can at least not going to have the chance to hit a perimeter shot. Nobody is banking on Hibbert to hit no 12, 15 footers consistently. Man, you know what's killing me about Frank Vogel, man? And like I don't know why I'm forgetting the kid's name right now. What's the kid's name on the bench with the dreads? I'm always trying to get in the game. Oh my God! Uh, the, the, dude the, from the, the dude from the next man, oh. that dude. I'm, man, I'm telling you, man, the dude needs to play more. He can shoot. He can actually. He's actually a real stretch four. They could be, and he he he's uh, active defensively. So I don't understand why they don't go to situations with like him and Skull or him and West where they come a little small. Because Miami's small, and you still won't you still won't lose any aggression, and he can pull Bosch away from the lane as opposed to when in there getting his Frankenstein on. So hey, um, you know I the majority think, of coaches when they get to the playoffs, they they you know they were they go and they tighten their their uh, their rotations up, and they want to go with the horses that got them there. Plus, he may be concerned about your boy's mental state that if he brings somebody else in there, your man might start sulking. Yeah, man, you ain't got to worry about him because I think uh, a lot of that um, over-hypeness and, you know, all them, you know, giving them the benefit of the doubt for all-stars, that's gone after what he did this year, man. He's really going to have to prove himself in the beginning part of next year 
Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of centers in the East, but I think they're going to, you know, like Noah to me um, has surpassed them already in a lot of people's mind state, and I can see a lot of other guys getting more consideration after what uh, Hibbert's been distributing it, uh, in these playoffs lately. Um, real quick, um, let's talk about the game tonight. San Antonio um, hosting Oklahoma City again. Um, 122 points is too much, man. <laughs> like, y'all really gave up 122 points in the playoffs? That's kind of embarrassing for Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, Scott right. Brooks needs to make some adjustments, and Nick Collison's not the answer. I think he should play Perry Jones, man. I know it's another one of the situations where, you know, it's trusting your vets and the guys that got you there. But I just think Perry Jones is, a, is, is better for him defensively and offensively. Like, Nick Collison didn't give him anything last game. Um, and he doesn't have the, well, the height or the athleticism to slow down Duncan or uh, Splitter. Hey, the bottom line is they they're in trouble. The whole Abaka thing, because Abaka, you know, Abaka was the the anchor on defense, and then um, you know, Slim Reaper will go ahead and support him. Without him being there, that really makes a uh, a lot of things fall on um on KD. And KD, to me, needs to go ahead, and I think he will. He needs to take more an aggressive stance with being um, more team-oriented with the rebounds and helping out defensively and being more of a defensive stalwart because I know no one likes to talk about KD because he's such a nice guy and all that BS, but he can do a lot more for that team than what he's doing. He should be, he should be averaging double-digit rebounds along with uh, with Ibaka, and he should be in the post more scoring, and also he should be guarding more players from the post. So I think he's going to be forced to do that because they're not going to want to go back to OKC and, uh, you know, down uh, O2. Hey, so I think he's going to go and you're going to see him. And another reason why I'm thinking you need to have Perry Jones playing a little bit, man, you've got to have somebody there that can block a shot, man. You know, Parkins can't run in transition. He's not a, a real shot blocker. He's a good post defender. But, man, I've never seen so much of a parade going to the basket than we saw that last game. I mean, the Spurs would get into the cup at will. Either either turnaround jumpers or Ginobili and Parker and all those who's driving. They were getting layups the whole game. It was yeah, they did. They, they, uh, they scored, what, 66 points in the paint. So half yeah, of the 122 so. was was in the paint alone. <laughs> That's ridiculous, you know what I mean? Like, like really, dude? Like, it's not like it's not like the Spurs got like like. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, okay, Duncan, I gotta respect them. But this ain't Duncan from ten years ago. Like, you know, like, he, he should not be giving you work like that. But like you said, but see, the thing is, they're depending upon the old head Collison, and they they're looking for the young boy uh, Adam to go ahead and do something. So look, bottom line, I know to me, it's more realistic for KD to go back to being in the burnt orange like he was in college and does on being more of a, a you know a team rebounder defender and helping and not scoring as much and telling Westbrook, you know, you got that for right now and help get other people involved than it is for me to expect Adam and, and Collison to step their game up. To me, it falls, it falls on KD because he has you the know, ability Collison, to do that. See, Collison's not even built for that. Like, you know, coming off the bench, having some spark plug minutes, that's cool. But for him to be the, the dependent on, you could tell he was, wasn't was prepared for it. And to me, they need to think about Jeremy Lamb, too. Yes, Thabo used to be that dude, but right now he's not giving them anything. He's not, you know, locking down Parker or anything on the defensive end. He's not scoring the offensive end. So, you know, throw them young bucks in there, man. Get them, have them playing with uh, KD and Westbrook. At least they can maybe put it this way. They're not going to be any more of a liability on defense than the the other guys they're playing. When you give up 122 points, it doesn't matter who you, who's on there on your court. Y'all aren't stopping anybody, so you might as well put some offensive weapons well, there so that Westbrook and uh, KD aren't the only dudes shooting the rock. Well, listen, well that's their role. That's that's they're supposed to do. But my thing is, look, it's one game. Let's see if those guys can play better or step up in the second game. You you can't just just. You know, you're a coach. You can't just go ahead and just, after one game, just be like, oh, okay, we're scrapping everything. You got at least, least you got at least get those guys two games to to, to f up. And then, then if they both go yeah. into the same thing and it's and a dog on parade, then okay, then you you'll be justified because you're down 0-2 and you got to do something. So, but my only thing, like that's something different than it's like, hey, man, you got a you have a 12 man in uniform for a reason, and it's like unless these dudes are just like on a totally different level. 
sometimes you need to throw guys in the fray and see what they can do in these situations, man. Um, but here's the thing, though. The playoffs is not the time for that. You're supposed to do that during the course of the year. Hey, you got to do it in the play. Play To me, the playoffs is the perfect time. Nah, like, man. Yo. Nah, <laughs> man. You, you do that during the course of the year, bro. The playoffs are too. The playoffs are the wrong time for that crap. But you, you, I'm saying, uh, like, it's like with Hibbert. Those games where he had donuts, right? How long are you going to sit there and wait for this dude to have donuts when I got somebody else that's like, yay, maybe this dude will give me eight. You know what I mean? Maybe this dude will at least grab, like, five boards. You know, to me, you you got to trust your your roster and your players a little bit more, you know. Sometimes you guys are a little too conservative, you know. And, and I've seen the Spurs do that in the past. I've seen Steve Kerr in the past with Spurs ride the bench, all of a sudden pop throws them in. This dude, like, basically stays the playoff series. You know, he has a monster mm-hmm. game. So um, I, I just wish other coaches would be that creative. And, you know, you know to me, like, Nick Collison and Furry Baca is a conservative move. It, it's – and you got a conservative result. To me, if you want to win, you need to be, you know, and trust somebody, empower somebody, build them up, and see what they can bring. Um, but like you said, let's watch and see. It's only one game. Maybe these guys will be inspired to play better. But yo, if I don't see nothing from you out of the first quarter, I'm yanking you for young blood, man. I ain't got time for that. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm saying. Okay. You know? Yeah, man. But uh, hey, I think that's a good point, man. Well. Uh, Stop today. We'll get us another show in here on Friday. Um, see the results of this game. Hopefully, some more momentum will pick up from the draft. We'll continue with that conversation and uh, pick up on some NFL tidbits, man. So, all right. That's it. Appreciate it, y'all. This is B Street Sports Talk Radio. Stay safe out there. Peace.